the Holy Gospel, is written in the 21st chapter of St. Matthew, beginning with the 23rd verse. When Jesus entered the temple, the chief priest and the elders of the people came up to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things, and who gave you this authority? Jesus answered them, I also will ask you one question, and if you tell me the answer, then I also will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, from where did it come? From heaven or from man? And they discussed it among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say to us, Why then did you not believe him? But if we say from man, we are afraid of the crowd, for they all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We do not know. And he said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Here ends the gospel. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text, it is the gospel heard read from the 21st chapter of St. Matthew. But let's hear again the question put before our Lord by the religious leaders. By what authority are you doing these things and who gave you this authority? Well, the religious leaders have put the question of authority on the table today. The chief priests and elders of the people, the guardians and stewards of the religious institutions and traditions of Israel were challenging Jesus' authority. Who did he think he was? Riding into Jerusalem like some kind of Messiah or Christ, turning over the tables of the money changers and calling the temple his house. My house, he says, shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves, Jesus once said. So who did this Jesus think he was, walking around the temple and teaching the people as though he owned the place? The religious leaders were right in that it is a matter of authority. But what authority are you doing these things? And the key word there is authority. Now we tend to think of authority in terms of power, the power to do this or that. And that is true, but there's more to it than just that. Authority is a matter of permission. Permission granted by another to do certain things. So the President of the United States is authorized by the people to be the chief executive officer of the nation, or a judge sitting on the judicial bench has been permitted to judge cases. So to have authority is to have permission from someone greater to say and to do certain things. When a pastor forgives sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, He does so in the stead and by the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, by his authority. In fact, he approves of it, delights in it, recognizes it, and stands behind it. Thus, it is permitted. And we would be outraged, rightly so, if someone simply assumed authority without having received it. So when the authorities knock at your door, they have to present the evidence in the form of a badge or legal papers that show they have the authority to search your home. Someone just doesn't decide to be president one day, do they? Or even a pastor of a congregation. It's granted, it's permitted, it's authorized. Well, in terms of a pastor, that's what call and ordination are all about. And all of this lies behind the question of the temple authorities. By what authority do you, Jesus, come in here and stir up all sorts of trouble? Who authorized you? Who sent you? It's a good question. Because Jesus claims the kind of authority that no one would dare claim for himself. Now the people, they were amazed at the words of Jesus because he taught as one who had authority in himself. Someone who didn't need to reference another, unlike their own teachers or the temple authorities who were questioning him. Again, no one dared speak this way, and no one dared turn over the tables of the money changers and sacrifice sellers or criticize what's going on in the temple. Jesus' own words and works gave witness to his authority. He told them as much. If you don't believe his words, then look at his works, healing the sick, casting out demons, stilling the storms, walking on water, casting out demons, raising the dead. These are not run-of-the-mill good works. 
These are the works that God does, and only one who is authorized by God can do these kinds of things. The miracles of Jesus, they are his badge of authority. In his words, in his works, well, they were very well known. There was no one walking around Jerusalem who hadn't heard about this Jesus, least of all the religious leaders. Dear friends, this is chapter 21 in Matthew's Gospel. This is Holy Week. The week that Jesus enters Jerusalem one last time to die and rise. And the cards, they have all been laid on the table since John's baptism, where Jesus was visibly and audibly approved by the descent of the Spirit and the voice of the Father who said, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Now the religious authorities, they wouldn't have any of that. They refuse John's baptism, and they understand why they refuse it. Don't let their smooth talk fool you. John was calling them to repent of their religion and Jewish baptism. Well, that was for the proselyte, for the newbies coming into the faith, not for lifers. So this was an insult to their authority. Who did John think he was? And that's precisely the point of Jesus' question. The baptism of John, where did it come from? And until Jesus got an answer for that question, there would be no answer from him about where his authority comes from. You can't debate unbelief. You can only corner it, kind of box it in with nowhere else to go. You can't reason with someone into believing, nor can you logically convince someone that Jesus is the one to trust. Nor can you answer every question that unbelief and denial throws in your face. Because there is no end to the question. So Jesus doesn't answer their question, but instead backs them into an extremely uncomfortable corner. And that's also how it's going to be with us when we approach God with our endless questions, looking for some trap, some loophole, some way to negate and neutralize this Jesus. He'll box you into a corner every single time with no way out except to deal with Jesus. For no one comes to the Father except through Jesus, and no one receives the Spirit except by Jesus. So you can talk about God all you want, but Jesus is where all the action is. From where did the baptism of John come? Notice, again, Jesus has them cornered. There's no safe way for them to answer this question, and they know it. If they said it's from heaven, well, they knew what the next question was going to be. Well, if it's from heaven, why didn't you believe him? Why did you refuse his baptism? And they'd be left in a puddle of their own unbelief. However, these religious leaders were shrewd. They're tactical. They were aware that John was incredibly popular and that people revered John as a prophet sent from God. And if they said that John's baptism was from man, well, the crowds would turn on them. So they went that soft, beige, say-nothing way of political correctness. They went agnostic, quite literally, and they said, we don't know. And that is what the word agnostic means, don't know. John came preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins in preparation for the coming Messiah and the dawning of the kingdom of God. And the best that the religious leaders can come up with is, we don't know. The same might be asked today of holy baptism. Is it from God or from man? Is it God's mandate and authority or is it from man? Is it, as some would say, an outward sign to show that you are a Christian, a way to actualize your commitment to God? Or is it the power of God for salvation? Is it the washing of rebirth and renewal, the very means by which the death and life of Jesus come to you? To answer such questions with, we don't know, That's not going to cut it. Unbelief is incredibly stubborn. And it's not a self-healing condition. It's unreasonably resistant, which is why we cannot, by our own reason or strength, believe in Jesus Christ our Lord or come to him. He must come to us, engage us, deal with us by word and spirit, baptize us, forgive us, and feed us. It is he who must break down those walls of skepticism, atheism, agnosticism, our darkened thinking, our stunted imaginations, our unwillingness to go beyond the realm of what we can see or comprehend. Your friends that you believe at all 
is a gift of God's undeserved goodness. Now you and I, we're prone to the same sort of questioning. And I'm, I'm not talking here about the normal questions of faith, questions born out of a genuine curiosity and a desire to learn more. I'm talking about the questions that challenge God and who he is, the questions that challenge Jesus' authority in his church and in our lives. When you and I think that we know better than the Lord how to save us and how to deal with us, or when we become our own lords and work our own way to the faith, you know, cafeteria style, just picking and choosing the parts that we like and then, you know, leaving the parts that we don't behind. When we begin our statements with the words that God can't, God doesn't, or Jesus wouldn't or couldn't, it's time for repentance, a time of turning back, a return to the font of baptism, to the word of forgiveness, to the supper of Jesus' body and blood. You won't have every intellectual itch scratched or every doubt addressed. But you will know this for a certain fact. Jesus Christ died for you, rose for you, and reigns for you, lording his death and his life over your sin and death, and that nothing in this life can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. For God has laid his baptismal claim upon you. He has justified you in Jesus, his son, whom he sent with divine authority to be your savior and to take away the sin of the world by his dying and rising. Why will you die, O house of Israel, says the Lord through his prophet Ezekiel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord God, so turn and live. Trust the Lord of your baptism and you will live. For he is authorized by the Father to save you, and he has done it. It is finished. In the name of Jesus, amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, you exalted your Son to the place of all honor and authority, Enlighten our minds by your Holy Spirit that confessing Jesus as Lord, we may be led into all truth. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us pray the prayer that our Lord teaches us, boldly saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Thank you for watching. We hope you enjoyed the message that was brought to you today. If you'd like to watch more, you can subscribe to Worship Anew by hitting the subscribe button down below or by clicking on our logo to the right. Also, feel free to watch one of the two featured videos shown here. If you'd like to watch the full program, please visit our website, worshipanew.org. I'm Eric Kaczynski, and on behalf of all the staff and volunteers, I thank you for worshiping with us.